great. Well, that was smooth. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. That's great. So uh, last week we had um, uh, we, we had uh, uh, Russ from Muffinzaif and we it actually took him took us 10 minutes before we got everything up and running. So that was quite uh, quite a surprise. And now we have you on the on the top of the hour, absolutely perfect on point. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> yeah, well, I I don't know how I managed, but I mean, I I had a few beers already. It's quite late, so. Well, well, you're Czech, right? So I wouldn't have expected otherwise. Well, I'm not such a beer person, but uh, I went to have a dinner with a friend. So. Oh, that's great. That's great. I've always I've always enjoyed uh, going to the Czech Republic. And, um, and 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 beer was always part of that as well. So I, uh, <laughs> and especially with yeah. good food as well, that that really helps. Um, so if you're ready, uh, I'm ready, yeah. then we can uh, get this show on the road. So I'll uh, I'll just um, start off, and um, that will do that. So um, everyone, um, welcome, well to another great episode at least that's what we're planning for of the modular clubhouse so um my name is jesper scherpenhauser i'm the host for tonight and i also host the uh, modular clubhouse youtube channel uh, to which we'll link in the companion channel uh, talking about the companion channel uh, please feel free to use that to ask any questions that you have during the interview or post any links that you might want to uh, post there as well um yeah, just use that. So today is a very special occasion because we have uh, Václav from Bastel joining us to uh, to talk a bit more about music, modular, synthesizers, uh, the new soft pop uh, SP2 uh, as well, and anything else that we might uh, get to the table. Um, so Václav, first off, uh, thank you so much for uh, for joining. How, how's your day been up until now? Well, good, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm trying to finish up some of the works on the soft pop. So we're building the first batch. So um, I was just trying to make sure that everything works smooth on the firmware side. So we do a bit more testing on the firmware and then we can start flashing the units. So I'm pretty much in the release mode at the moment. Great. Just so making sure everything works, but looks looks good so far so and what is then your specific responsibility during that actual release are you really still hands down into uh the actual uh, manufacturing and, and and qaing or um not really i'm i'm the developer of um mm -hmm. at, i'm like the lead developer at, at bastel and uh Regarding the soft pop, that was uh, very much a collaboration, creative collaboration with Peter Edwards, Casper mm -hmm. Electronics. Yeah. So uh, we were mostly like doing all the um, creative uh, decisions and technical decisions. And then there were a few more people involved in the process from the, from the crew. So, uh, there is a tester uh, you have from Finland, so he's, uh, he's our main tester now. So he's been really great to, you know, mm -hmm. to finalize the firmware. And uh, then there is the whole team in Brno at, uh, at Bastel. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so there is uh, Martin, uh, who is uh, very much the link between me and the production. And he did a lot of the circuit board design and also optimizing for production and he's also overseeing the whole process and then there is Nastya and she's ordering a lot of the materials making sure everything comes in time um mm -hmm. yeah then uh, there is a uh, we work with a graphic studio called animate so they did the graphic graphic layout for the enclosure and also for the for all the printed stuff, the box and everything. Nice, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody at Bustle is a bit involved. So I was mm -hmm. also working with the testing team who, who do the testing. 
uh, the quality testing. Um, so we've been doing a lot of back and forth. They also did some of the beta testing. Mm -hmm. uh, although the beta testing group was uh, quite a bit wider. And uh, and yeah, I also see Patrick here in the audience. <laughs> so Patrick uh, uh, is uh, is responsible for all the video content. And you know, if if you if you see us talking through social media, that's that's mostly <laughs> Patrick. Great. So, uh, so we'll probably get, need to get him up on yeah. stage as well later during uh, tonight's interview. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if he wants. <laughs> well, that's, sure. a, that's, a, that's a great point. So um, for those of you who've never been to uh, the Modular Clubhouse before, uh, so the plan is um, uh, Vaclav and I will first do, well, as, as you've already guessed, a bit of an interview. And then later on, we are going to open it up to the audience. Uh, so anyone that has any questions, uh, can just join us on stage and ask that question. Um, if you are incapable or if you are unable to join us on stage, but you do have a question, again, feel free to use the companion channel for that. And we'll uh, make sure that we uh, try to answer your questions as um, as honestly as possible. So, uh, uh, Vaitla, a bit of a more personal question. So how did you actually get started with music? How was your uh, musical upbringing when you were uh, growing up? Yeah, uh, I mean, I played piano mm -hmm. know, as a kid, uh, which is something I didn't really like that much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I think for me, music kind of started when I finished with the piano lessons and then started to explore piano for my own and kind of try to figure out how it actually works, you know, which two keys to press together and how it sounds good. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, then I also got uh, really sucked into music making on the computer. So my friend showed me first Fruity Loops and then uh, Reason. Yeah. So I've been a huge Reason user since I was, I don't know, maybe 15, 14, mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. like that. And um, I've been doing quite a lot there and then eventually switched to Ableton. And yeah, at some point I was really paralyzed by Ableton or like this whole world inside the computer because there was like too many possibilities. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I kind of started making, uh, I kind of turned to hardware because uh, it was like that time when some of the first, you know, uh, portable cheaper synths started to appear on the market, like the Cork Monotron or the K Oscillator and like some of these early things. So I was really drawn to that. And also at that time I started to build my own circuits and mostly like modifying what I could find online, which wasn't a lot at the time. Yeah, 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 great, absolutely. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to uh, pick a bit further into, um, but going into from a from a, from a music uh, childhood, did, you, did your parents play a lot of music when you were growing up? Anything in particular that you listened to during your, uh, your teenage years or how did your musical tastes evolve as well in parallel? Um, hmm. I don't think my parents really listened to very interesting music that would really influence <laughs> me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, my mother was listening to a lot of like folk singers and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, sort of political folk singers that were maybe like not really allowed to perform during yeah. the communist times. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was fine, but I didn't really had a lot of connection to that maybe until recently when I started singing myself and writing also my own lyrics in Czech. Mm -hmm. So maybe that came a bit of a full circle, but uh, I, I don't think it had like really profound impact. I think it was more important what I was getting through friends and getting, you know, uh, uh, just ripping some of the early CDs and yeah, we always uh, borrowed some CDs from the library and then went to copy them at a friend's house or somewhere and, uh, and then eventually I got some first like techno mixes on a, on a CD and that, that was kind of like the thing that really 
thrown <laughs> me into also making my own stuff. So really having that 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 that, that rebellious approach and now coming full circle to reappreciate the uh, the music you heard as as a kid that that's 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 great to hear so actually writing your own lyrics um you said you, you write them in czech um but what kind of topics do you touch upon in your own music um yeah i mean there is uh, there is quite a variety of topics but like a lot of of my li lyrics deal with relationships and some of those like um, love uh, metaphors also relate to the state of world like both politically and both yeah maybe towards climate change or some sort of inability to like deal with certain things as as we do often in relationships but also as a society so there is yeah. uh bunch of these parallels in my lyrics but uh, then so did, yeah. other stuff is like very like personal also I can imagine but it's it's good to hear that the well the the the, the protest songs that your mother then listened to mm -hmm. that you are indeed in in, in 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 some way shape or form are continuing that as well if you say well you do take love as a as a parable as an uh, as an analogy to the state of the world how things that how the the most important topics are well actually impacting us and how we should be changing them yeah i mean it's kind of it, it feels like almost everyone had has had like good and bad experience with with relationships mm -hmm. either friends or or love and uh it often gets like very intense, but uh, it's it's not that common that we get such a strong emotional connection to the things that are happening like politically in the world or yeah. like some of the big things that we really need to act on as a as a society. And I always mm -hmm. somehow saw that maybe music has the potential to connect those together, like that maybe through music people could maybe understand some 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 of the importance of like acting also on a, on, a, on a larger scale i don't know no well i think that that makes absolute sense that's of course something that uh we have seen throughout history when where music has brought people together and has been a catalyst for uh for change and for um I might not say revolution, but maybe more of an evolution um, in well, in preaching things like uh, like peace, in preaching things like tolerance, and those things as well. So I, I fully understand and I embrace uh, your approach to it. Yeah, and um, you know, also then, like when when it comes to like the instrumental parts or like the modular synths, mm -hmm. like when when. I, I guess most of us in this room have this experience of really like patching the synthesizer and having like all these different modules, like all these like actors sort of like in the system that are connected in certain way and configured in certain way to interact with each other. And we all know that like most of the time and a lot of the configurations like either don't make sense or sound horrible, but like <laughs> there are the sweet spots that you, that you kind of need to aim for. And I think the act of like patching up a modular synthesizer and making something pleasant on it is, um, yeah, might also be a metaphor for, I don't know, how we <laughs> function <laughs> function as a as yeah. A group, but I I, I I I love that that metaphor. I, I love that approach. I've never thought about it like that because, as, as you said, if you look at your your modules. And you say, as you, you you call them actors, and I like that because um, then you, on the one hand, you as the the composer, you are actually not just directing music, but you are making sure that you create the creation, the, the connections, or maybe even if you might say it like that, the actual kind of relationships between these these modules, and you then see how from relationships that you might not have thought of beforehand. Uh, could run into these happy little accidents that, well, 
uh, we're all looking for, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's great. And, uh, just just imagine if, you know, the, the synth was even able to patch itself up that like, you know, the modules <laughs> would just be reconfiguring themselves. That's kind of like my, that, that's what I dream about, like uh, a modular <laughs> synth that keeps like reconfiguring itself and uh, that it takes the life on its own and doesn't need me anymore. Oh, wow. That is actually, that that's a nice thought experiment as well because um, so so my, my background and what I currently do during my day job all has to do with artificial intelligence and if you then say well you want to build something that resembles a neural network that is capable of, 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 of creating these connections on the fly itself and then testing how they interact and then apply that to to modular we'll need to write yeah. a VCV rack uh, plugin for that yeah, I think in, in the software realm, it, it should be definitely possible. Absolutely, that great. Would be, that would be amazing if somebody did that, yeah. So we need to patent that ASAP, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's great. That's great. And um, I, I love the the philosophy that you... Because this is, this is coming from somewhere. And I think that if we get to know you a bit better during this interview, uh, we'll come to understand what your core philosophy is when it comes to, well, these sort of human interactions, but at the same time also how you look at um, modular and, and patching and, and music creation as a whole. I, I, I do want to pick up on something that you said uh, in, your, um, in, in a bit of your introduction, and that is, of course, the, the paralysis you felt when you were getting sucked into Ableton. And that is, of course, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, that was due to the, well, to the unlimited availability of options that you had there. Uh, but do you think that that is something that was more commonly present and that was one of the main reasons why we saw that extreme uptake in modular and into hardware synthesizers over the course of the last couple of years? Um, I think it's one of the reasons. I don't think it's the only reason. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, I've been now like working on the soft pop for I don't know, like a really long time, and it, that's like a that's just like one voice, you know. And you can actually write music just like on that one voice. That's like doesn't need anything else. Yeah. Just imagine like having only one track in Ableton, you know? Yeah. Like how how amazing that would be. <laughs> <laughs> because like once once you are confronted with this interface that you can always like layer on top in in, uh, in, in this way, it kind of like takes you away from like what actually is, is the core idea of electronic music. And that is to move the speaker membrane back and forth right so you, mm -hmm. you are creating this motion that vibrates the air and uh, if you if you are working with like the hardware i guess guess you might be aware of the or even if you're working in an in a analog domain you can sometimes you know when you're plugging these cables you can imagine those electrons going back and forth or something like that but like that idea is like so abstracted if you are just like layering tracks and tracks in Ableton and putting like insane amounts of plugins, compressors, and so on. It just like gets so abstracted. Yeah. Uh, and and you kind of like are very very away from from what I think are some of the basics that make sound electronic music really good on speakers. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know if that makes sense, but. Uh, but yeah, I actually got uh, got back to producing on a computer recently, and I'm still kind of relearning that uh, mm -hmm. right now. now. So I switched to Bitwig actually, and uh, I'm okay. I'm still making music on on hardware, but I do a lot you of the mixing yeah. and uh, especially vocal production. I I need to do that in yeah. In yeah. You said you, you you try to combine the best of both worlds in that approach, then. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, I actually write a lot of music on the 
Electron Digitone mm-hmm. or Digitone House. I don't know how what's the right <laughs> Swedish way to say it. Uh, but I love that machine because it has like limited amount of voices and all, all only four tracks. You know, mm-hmm. I think if you can if you can write a, like a song only in four tracks, I think you're just not really like trying to build the energy somewhere uh, like i don't know like you don't keep adding like hi hats and percussion and blah 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 like all this stuff yeah but you can like get the same musical function or like the energy driver out of those four tracks by like not making like a generic like hi hat like trap mm-hmm. beat pattern or whatever you know because it, like yeah. you, you just don't have like that many like not that you can't do it on the digiton but i think it's a uh, it's a uh, really um helpful i don't know uh helpful practice to be limited yeah. to only for four tracks i mean yeah. so actually having having the limitations apply to it yeah yeah i i think four tracks are amazing i mean i've worked <laughs> with ops that, that has eight and some roland group boxes that also have eight and i kind of find it like it's too much <laughs> perfect i love Sometimes. it yeah and and do you think that because you are then applying these these limitations upon yourself whether it's oh i want to just have one voice in something like the uh, uh the the, 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 soft, uh, the soft pop or in like you said in the digitone where you have four tracks do you think that because you are limiting yourself you get closer to the essence of music or is it more okay well less is more and i just want to create or become better at making something really minimal hmm i don't think it's like the less is more approach or or even the uh, minimal approach Mm -hmm. i think for me what kind of makes the difference if you like let's say think of the low end or the bass yeah. and of, of of your music as as one thing yeah that you don't think of it as like kick and bass and toms and or something you know mm-hmm. it's it really like helps me to think of it as, as as a one thing that kind of needs to be in tune and if it's like one voice it always you know makes room for each other whereas if it's not you like need to do all the side chain compression and like spend a lot of time like engineering it in a way that it actually sounds good on us on the speakers that it yeah. doesn't like you know eat each other up or something so um yeah i guess that's like Mm-hmm. Uh, thinking about the functions in in the musical sense a bit more yeah. in a unified way. I don't know. So would I be uh, understanding that correctly? Where you say, well, instead of just thinking about the auditable representation of instruments in electronic music. Um, might be limiting but if you then say well i'm only going to think about what i want to do in the lower regiments i want i want to know what i what i'll be doing in the higher regiments and i know what i'm going to be doing in the mids and just stop thinking about instruments but just thinking about the the actual sounds themselves yeah i, I that's somehow probably quite close to what i'm trying to say yes. <laughs> okay great <laughs> well and I, I i see that we already have uh dan g who was pointing out that that was also something that uh russ from muffin um was talking about last mm-hmm. week as well that that was a very um freeing way for him to um well to think about music design as well uh, when you stop thinking about instruments but rather start thinking about the sounds that you want and the sound that you want in the low end the sound that you want in the mid end and the the well the kind of sounds that you want to combine into the the high uh, notes as well so i think that that's it's it's great to see that your minds think alike in that in that way as well so thanks dan for pointing that out as well um cool. So then, if we if we if we take a step back and if we look at how you then started, um, so you you listen to techno, you listen to those first CDs that you then copied uh, using the uh, <laughs> the CD recorders and the CD burners from those ta- from 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 those days. 
and you getting your hands on your first uh, physical uh, pieces of equipment. So what were uh, a couple of those first synthesizers or drum computers or any sort of hardware that you were uh, working with at that time? I I actually was always like very like low on the budget because I was student and you know couldn't really afford much so mm -hmm. I, I think what really got me into making my own stuff a lot was the Cork Monotron mm -hmm. because yeah. it was like really cheap and you could actually go in and hack it and uh, it was designed that that's who I designed it in a way that they are like labeled uh, points on the circuit boards that you could just like solder to and these would be the, like the patch points basically so you could like actually convert it into like tiny modular synth almost yeah or like in interface it with other stuff so this this was like one of the first things that i that i bought and uh i also had like the mini chaos pad and mini oscillator uh, for a while and then basically i just started to build my own my own stuff, which was a lot of the stuff was based on the Arduino mm -hmm, yeah. platform. So for those who are not familiar, it's a, it's like an open source hardware platform that you can program and it's basically a chip that you program on your computer and then the chip runs on its own and it's programmed to do something. Yeah. And uh, because it was like, made in this open source spirit a lot of people like made pieces of codes or libraries that you could use to make sound on an arduino yeah and it was always very lo-fi but i really liked that mm -hmm. and um, that's how i started to build my own first sense and eventually i i kind of really wanted to like build the whole sort of uh, uh ensemble of you know like having like maybe analog drums and some digital voice and, and a bass voice and something like that mm -hmm. so the whole so diy the... approach was already ingrained within you uh from the start from the moment you started to get your hands on uh, uh on your first sins like those monotrons and you circuit bent them into whatever you wanted yeah exactly i mean i never i actually came kind of late to the circuit bending, bending party, but also like early enough for this, like, um, it, it, there wasn't really a lot of, um, stuff in the cheap category, like when, when I was starting to, to do this kind of stuff. So there really were like the cork, there was the cork stuff and not much else. Mm -hmm. There was like, uh, the dr bleep or what was his name or uh, something like like there are there were a few like <laughs> diy projects you could you could like look look at uh, the atari punk console and like these these projects yeah and because there was like so little you could i could afford to buy and also there wasn't like a, a million things you could build it was still quite limited mm -hmm. then i kind of tried it all and then just went <laughs> from there and made my own stuff so it was kind of like also good timing i guess yeah of course great and then um just to quickly touch upon that as well so um you said most of this you were doing while you were still studying uh, what were you studying at the time so i went to study um uh, at the art university so i was it's a, like a fine art fine art school but i was studying multimedia okay and basically there i had like really a lot of time just to learn to work with electronics. I was doing also some like interactive stuff and working with motors and robotics. Great. Uh, stuff like that. Not that the university really helped me to <laughs> do much, but it was very helpful in like being very easy thing to study that wasn't very demanding. And I just had a lot of time just to figure it out on my yeah. own. And also a lot of this open source hardware movement and this maker movement was happening at the same time so there were resources online that uh, i could basically learn learn it all by myself yeah and did they also provide um well the gear and the the equipment that you needed in order to do your things or was that also typically done from your home or how did you approach that 
mean, I had a room in the, in the university where I could work, so that was kind of all I needed. And also what was very helpful in that period was that, which is something I found out later, that wasn't that common in other parts of the world, but uh, in the Czech Republic or in Brno specifically when, when I was studying, it was really easy to get components. It was like literally like 10 minute walk from my studio to the store where I could just like, you know, I could like just Google schematics for Atari Punk console, like write down the shopping <laughs> links, walk 10 minutes, get it, get back to my studio and like build the whole thing in like under two hours, you know? Oh, wow. And like <laughs> you, you, you I really didn't need to like go and shop online or, or or whatever. It was like really easy to get the stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was kind of also helpful. And uh, also one of the things that kind of stood out during that, during those years or in uh, through this experience was that in this store, there was always line of people waiting to buy stuff. <laughs> and uh, like at that time, I really didn't know a lot about electronics, but like when I just asked the, the, the shop assistants for some stuff and I didn't really know all the specifications, usually there was somebody in the line that kind of helped me, you know? Oh, great. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, through that, I also, uh, we, we discovered that uh, there is uh, quite a lot of, uh, uh, DIY background in, in the in the whole of Czech Republic and and that maybe is something that that's kind of interesting to mm -hmm. to look at and that's also how I started with uh, Andre Merta with uh, with my uh, partner in crime uh, we started <laughs> a pro project called Standuino which was very much this sort of like artsy project that uh, that we made to kind of talk about the DIY culture, mm -hmm. uh, but then we all already started to make workshops and first synths and transformed that whole thing into bustle instruments just, I don't know, a year and a half later. So that's where you actually started to say, okay, well now we are going to uh, bite the bullet and we're going to, we're going to give this a try. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of like very like we didn't really know what we were doing in the sense that like uh we made few workshops we built some stuff somebody posted a video online and then people started to ask us hey can we can we buy this if we can't attend the workshop and like it was like people from japan or you know something like, <laughs> like what, what is this you know and uh so eventually we like really like diy some like crappy web store <laughs> where you could like pay with PayPal and so, so we did that and that was great and people actually bought it we actually somehow found out that some people that there was some sort of forum where people were like really hyping this because it was really great for making soundtracks for horror movies <laughs> so so uh, yeah, uh, of, uh, which 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 uh, which pieces of hardware are we talking about right now? Could we still? So that was yeah. Uh, the if you would Google Standuino Fra Angelico, that was like the first one that we did put in the online store. Uh, that one Standuino. got some like yeah. miniature miniature fame in the horror soundtrack. Oh wow! <laughs> I and... love that. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so we did put it up online and uh, I don't know, two weeks later, uh, PayPal sent us email. Hey, we blocked all, all your money because you need to send us your company details. And we we're like, what <laughs> company details? Like we're doing this art project, you know, like <laughs> try to explain that to PayPal, right? Because they, there is no people working at PayPal. It's just like all automated. So. Yeah, ever since we Elon to... Musk stopped working there, no one is working there anymore. <laughs> he was the only one there. So, <laughs> yeah. So so basically, PayPal told us that we are a company, so we had to we had to deal with that. And so you were strong armed into being. So first off, you've got these people all over the world tell, asking you for your um, 
uh, for your uh, Standuino, and then you say, okay, well, we're going to do that. So you you are being strong armed into creating a web store, and then it's actually going to be PayPal actually, uh, well, again, forcing you to uh, <laughs> to establish a company. Yeah, pretty much. Like it was like totally doing it like backwards. Like you know, <laughs> that's great. It's like I don't know if that is like. A... I don't know if you go to like a business school and they tell you this is how you start a company. <laughs> I imagine we did it like completely in the wrong order. Yeah, you could you could say that. Well, typically, well, people might call that the uh, the start of incubators nowadays, but that might be something different altogether. I love that. And then, if if you look back to that time, um, what was your 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 biggest lesson that you learned during that time? Wow, uh, I think it might have been that uh, like letting go of things that are good enough because mm -hmm. I think at that time like what we did it was like like when I look at it now as, as somebody who has you know over 10, 10 years experience of doing since I was like, how could have we sold like this? Like this, this was such trash, you know, it's like, <laughs> it barely worked, you know? And like, it was like so poorly implemented everything. And, but it somehow worked and it was like good enough, you know, like we played shows, we made music on it. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of learned that like, if it's like interesting and different then and people want to buy it, just like, I would just like let go and you know let people have it and i would not like just try to perfect the the best synthesizer in the world for like 10 years and then release it so it was like very quick iterative process that we were just like quickly releasing like new ideas mm -hmm. that people could buy yeah. yeah and then to talk a bit about the the name of course so you you, you said well from what I've read is that you said, well, we we taken the name of the uh, the Basliri um, as a as a moniker, uh, but what you then also said is that well, that was to uh, to mean something like DIY. Uh, but if I then mm -hmm. looked at um, some of, the, so I, I'm I'm no expert on the Czech language or any language for that matter. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I speak I speak like seven languages, but Czech is not one of them, and those seven languages I can't even speak one of them proper enough. But uh, when, when I was looking it up, uh, we I also found a term like uh, Kutilska. And could you could you explain a bit more what the difference is between the the, the Basliri and the Kutilska? What that difference actually is? Uh, yeah. So I think uh, the difference is from is is a bit regional. Mm -hmm. So in the in the western part of the country, people who like DIYR. DIY are more refer referred to as kutil mm -hmm. or uh, as, as kutilství and uh, in, in the eastern part when, where I'm from yeah. which and I'm from Brno which yeah. used to be an Austrian city uh, there was this uh, word uh, bastlit, bastlení, bastlíři which comes from German and it has its own specific meaning in German, which also is sort of like a DIY-ish oriented, but it more kind of refers to like small children making something from paper mm -hmm. and glue and whatnot. So, so there is this like German word that kind of became to be used in the in the more Eastern slang yeah. for electronics in the in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. So uh, and it also has has a bit of a bit of a negative connotation. Uh, you, you can use it as a as a negative term uh, if somebody like I don't know fixes something with a duct tape or something. Uh, that, that's also like one of one of the meanings. But so but it's in, more in, like in a hacker the... actually. Yeah, it's it's pretty much like a hacker and uh, and and bustle specifically in, in that like one. One one sense of the of the world really means DIY electronics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, would I be correct in saying that Bustle would then have more of a um, more of a punk connotation, or maybe even a more of a rebellious connotation to it, as opposed to uh, Kuchilsk, uh 
uh, that is more of a well look at me I'm the I'm the 40 year old dad that's gonna renovate his um, his something uh, yeah I think Kutil skill is, is a bit more of a, this like a renovator like working yeah. carpenter type thing and Bustler is a bit more yeah it, it's a bit more punk but also in some sense if people like use it with the electronics especially it's it's not really that punk anymore or it it, <laughs> it can it cannot be that's the possibility to not <laughs> so one of the things I, least... I still try to make is something that i can truly start calling electro punk so <laughs> i'm trying to bring those worlds together <laughs> right i mean so... Why we chose the name and why we are interested in in, in the world itself was mm -hmm. really uh, that was like this time like ten years ago when uh, there was this like big resurgence of the maker movement. Everybody was a maker and uh, yeah. there was this like open source hardware and this uh, this this whole like DIY ethos that basically came from the Western Europe uh, that came as sort of like. A, almost anti-capitalist protest yeah then we were kind of found ourselves in a, in a you know like going shopping for components like on the street meeting like all those people in the line building something at home and that 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 was like really a heritage of the of the communist times rather uh, where people couldn't really buy a lot of things and you, you had to like recycle and repair a lot of things out of necessity. Mm -hmm. However, that wasn't the only only social uh, social function of of this form of creativity. People also like made you know like uh, synchronized colorful lights for their for their gramophones, as, <laughs> as my father did. And yeah, uh, so so those things had more of a social functions to you know you know make parties or like impress girls or boys or mm -hmm. so. Um, and 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 my father has been like making stuff and i like really knew knew that from my home and like we were kind of like hey it's really interesting there's this like creativity that's being like embraced like worldwide here is our own like regional take on it which has like very kind of uh, specific uh background i guess yeah yeah so if I if I were to reword that where you said okay well on the one hand it was the the more global anti-consumerist uh, movement as in well making sure that things that are <laughs> not, not 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 working as they're supposed to where you can just take them to a uh, to a maker workshop on the one hand that that came from from the uh, from Western Europe and combining that with the well. Um, uh, the communist era approach of well we need to be capable of repairing things ourselves and we then also not just repairing them but also adding features to it uh, but making sure that you were able to on the one hand create it into something that you wanted for yourself but also making sure that you can one-off um, maybe indeed as you said impress the boys or girls that you were uh, that you wanted um, so is that because you, you mentioned very specifically that this was something from 10 years ago. Um, how do you see that that has evolved since then? Do you still think that there is a, a maker culture um, within the Czech Republic or Brno specifically or, or, or mm -hmm. Europe in general? Uh, I think it is. Uh, it's been like very much like taken over by like the like maker fair ethos yeah um yeah. but i mean like those 10 years ago like i mean it was always very present and it's, it still is present in the culture it's just like the people are getting older and maybe there's not that many young people who get into it but like i guess like at, at the time those 10 years ago for us what was interesting was uh some let's say the search for our own identity because like this is this is something that was like really huge in the 70s and 80s and uh, as uh, as Czechoslovakia and then Czech and Slovak Republic transitioned to capitalism mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We, we like like in in the cultural sense. Yeah. We really uh, tried to like not have our own identity. We're basically pretending like those past 40 years didn't happen, and uh, uh, that like in, in the spirit of the 90s and 2000s was very much like just taking whatever trends are happening in the West and just like a- adapting them or like just taking them for what they are. And we were kind of looking for something that 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 could be ours, something that uh, that we could yeah. like think like hey this is maybe like who we are or like that there was something that we could be proud of even or yeah. something like that because uh, as i say like uh, i i grew up in a time when I, i was basically ashamed to be from eastern europe because it wasn't cool you know and and so on so mm-hmm. no i i understand uh, where that's coming from of course so then in a in a sense so from from the people that i've um that i've worked with and that i've uh, become close with that come from from the czech republic um primarily from from the west um from the western part i should say um they they told me okay well of course when when everything happened when when the iron curtain was uh, absolved they they described it to me as saying well we celebrated freedom to the extreme and you describing on the one hand saying well we we actually just forgot we we try to forget or we try to act as though the the 30 or 40 years before that didn't happen is do you think that that's a a, a difference between how you in Brno and the rest of the eastern part of the Czech Republic experienced that as opposed to the western part or is that something that was It, that was more done on a personal level. I think there might be a bit of a east-west difference in the Czech Republic because if you ask people in Prague, they will tell you they are from Western Europe, whereas if you ask people in Brno, they will tell you they're from Eastern Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's you know, it, or maybe they, or in Prague, they, they could tell you they're in in Central Europe. But yeah. like we yeah. all know, like we're the Eastern Bloc, right? Uh, but uh, I guess mm-hmm. Brno and Slovakia, you are a bit more like aware. Like you, it's just like we, you're, we're not pay, painting the reality pink. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, so yeah. I, I guess as, I, I guess maybe that that upbringing was a bit more uh, of a yeah. realistic in the sense that like in just like not pretending we are a western european country in that regard yeah yeah and and from a from a generational standpoint i'm i'm assuming we don't uh <laughs> we're probably from the same generation I'm, i'm 38 years old um and if i look at europe i i look at i don't look at myself as a dutchman i look at myself as a european um but is that something that 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 our generation as in you and maybe even the younger generation in the Czech Republic shares as well um i think yeah i think uh, i mean i'm i just turned 34 and i think my my peers are kind of like half and half mm-hmm. some some like the ones who had like a bit more of the european experience you know going to erasmus going study abroad yeah yeah traveled a, a bunch like and the people like the young people from the cities i think those might like feel a bit more e- european as, as as i do myself yeah and the, the younger you go like people like below 30 i think that it's it, it's it's a lot more a lot more present it's a, it's a lot more natural Yeah, well, and especially the people below thirty, because they've never, they haven't actively or consciously experienced the the communist era. Era, of course. Yeah, I mean, I neither did I. I mean, I was like two years old when, when mm-hmm. the regime changed. But yeah, uh... yeah, but still, your parents lived through it, and those will have shared stories and will have. Um, imprinted their their take on that on you, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
But again, okay, so <laughs> I'm always, people always tell me, yes, but you run off on these tangents. So last week we had, um, we had Marianne Hedonia and we talked about recipes. So we, we it, it, it almost sounded like we have a, had a cooking channel. And then uh, after that we had Ross and we talked about World War II. So we sounded like a history uh, channel already and now we're talking about social economical and um, uh, and anthropological themes so we do lo seem to be like the human channel currently <laughs> so I do apologize for that fudge stuff um, but I think it's an interesting thing to to discuss as well um, so let's um, go a bit further into the uh, into the future where uh, you already explained a bit okay so well, this is how the actual uh, establishing of Bustle happened, how you were indeed strong-armed by PayPal to become a, a company. So how did that then evolve into the, well, the, the, the couple of dozen people that are currently employed by Bustle? So how did that grow come to, uh, how that growth come to be? Um, so I think mainly the micro granny, micro granny 2 specifically is the one to to point to so that was the the lo-fi sampler yeah that that uh, that became like very known and popular because when when we released it there were and still there is like very few samplers that are like cheaper and this one was for a long time the only one that could do some some of the granular tricks and and uh in, and it was very lo-fi so and has had this like very crunchy lo-fi sound and that's i that's why people still love it now it's still being mm -hmm. produced in the in the same way as we as we released it and um that so so that uh that th this sort of like playful product you know you have this uh small sampler uh, battery powered with a microphone you can manipulate sounds that's uh something that really pe people liked and uh, we built a lot of those in, during the years so uh so when when that happened when we announced that and uh, the order started coming in we really needed help uh, and yeah. we just turned to friends and some people came came to us asking if we needed help even if we didn't know each other it was mostly like uh, really musicians from from Brno that kind of approached us if we needed help or something, and uh, that's kind of how how the company grew. We we did it me, me like we very rarely really opened like made an open call for positions. It was yeah. like most of the people like just came came to work at Bastel. We have like very little experience just being enthusiastic about music and synths. <laughs> and then of course word of mouth helps and people will come and, and, and come to you to say well if you need any help then just uh, think of me and that's going to help as well going forward. Yeah so this is how, how the company grew from I don't know just me and Andre to what was at some point so definitely over 30 people maybe closer to 40 and now we're i don't know somewhere around 30 maybe a bit less mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah how, how do you see that e that actually evolving in the years to come so do you foresee on the one hand Basel to stay at this level and making sure that you still develop these great boutique on the one hand, well, uh, instruments, but also the Eurorack modules, or do you foresee any any changes in the future? Of course, we, I don't expect you to have a crystal ball where you can look into the future, but what are your expectations? Well, I I don't think we like really want to grow, I don't know, mm -hmm. in number of people or whatnot. I mean, <clears throat> it was just only very recently where we really kind of figured figured out how to how to make the stuff kind of correctly or the way it's <laughs> kind of done in like you know in 2020 uh, so i th i think 
technically and like when it comes to manufacturability, I think we kind of reached the point when we're kind of doing it kind of the way as it as it should be done and, and as it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, a lot of the time before we were just basically like losing a lot of money on the on the manufacturing and we weren't very efficient nor very like financially stable as a company uh and that i think has changed in the past few years and hopefully that's gonna like stay like that and uh that's also like what what we want because like you know we're also growing older and like a lot of the people uh at Bustle have families and so so we really want to have that stability mm-hmm. so that's just like you know co- company wise or like uh, human wise as uh, how, how we are and uh when it comes to like the goals for the company, I I mean I'm I'm I've been like the the developer and always I was always motivated by making stuff that wasn't here that wasn't around and uh, yeah. that that I wanted to play or I wanted to have uh, and this is still the main main driving uh, motivation behind like everything that I do and uh, that's also why we worked uh, why we work with Peter Edwards who is like this also like very personally driven uh, creator it's uh, yeah. or in in his you can like when, when you see his instruments they yes they are synths but like you can also see them as sort of like artworks or like things that have a personality uh, that you can like uncover. So I think I I really share that, and uh, I'm I'm very like interested in, in in the innovation aspect of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean to really do something new in uh, in sense, you really need the time to to invest and to learn. And I've been doing this for. 10 years professionally, yeah. uh, not really having to work other jobs, which is amazing. <laughs> and I'm kind of feeling like after those 10 years, I'm starting to kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I mean, I never studied like electronics, but like, like you can kind of see it, right? Like yeah. Moog also didn't like do like the best Moog synthesizer ever, like in the first year of his business, right? He had mm-hmm. to like built theremins and whatnot like for a long time before he could like deliver those iconic instruments so uh yeah and uh and having the company and and the platform and the audience who like really which is amazing we are still amazed that like people that there is this like audience and people who really want to buy those like very special unique sins and uh uh, I'm 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 just very grateful that I could be I could be doing this. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah. Could you actually ever w- take any other job than this? I don't know. <laughs> I've never <laughs> tried. I mean, I ha- I had I had other jobs like before, but like they were not like creative jobs. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I don't. I hope I won't need to. I mean, makes sense. Maybe, yeah, maybe like music wise. I mean, I play shows and I'm also being paid for playing music. So, but I'm not really like trying to make my living with music. Mm-hmm. But maybe eventually I would, I would like to maybe make a film score or something. But I'm not, it, I'm not sure if I'll ever have like that much time for music itself. <laughs> Then you need to uh, dust off your old Standuino and start to create scores for horror <laughs> movies again. Yeah, yeah, maybe that. <laughs> no, but that's perfect, and I, I, I do appreciate that that honesty as well. And as you said, well, um, you approach this from a very, uh, let's say, a developer standpoint. You you have a a creativity and an idea and a plan that you uh, uh, that you want to deliver, and then you've got. Uh, uh, Andres, who's, who's who's your partner in crime, as you already said, and you now have, of course, Victor as being the the CEO of the company. So, how mm-hmm. has that impacted 
uh, both you and your partner in crime to make sure, okay, well, the, the sole responsibility lies with him and that's it? Um, I mean, uh, I, I think Victor is doing a really great job and uh, yeah. he's, uh, he's introduced this... Uh, um uh, no. circular management i don't know if it's the correct term but that's how we call it and i think it might be a term actually so, so we what have was this the term like, again so i missed that circular management so we have like these different circles of different areas of the company and they yeah. like they are kind of like managing themselves and then like they like each person from each circle they meet and then they make bigger decisions Mm -hmm. about the company so like a lot of the people in the company are involved in the in the decision making and uh, so I'm also trying to like listen you know I'm always like listening to what what, what uh, people want to do and we've been doing yeah just so it, it's it's not just me or like single person that like mm -hmm. says like this is what we do and how we do it. I think uh, there is a bit more of this like collective consciousness. Yeah. And also the structure of the company is, is, is made like this. Yeah. It's more, it's more of an organic flat or organizational structure that you adhere to. Um, to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. That, that, that makes sense. And that also fits into, um, that whole perception of philosophy that we uh, talked about earlier. Um, so we are already well uh, way over uh, over time. So if you've if you've got any time left, uh, Vachilov, um I'd like to just ask you two my two last questions and then open it up to um, to the open Q and A part. Uh, if you're still available for that, I actually have three questions. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So yeah. <laughs> my 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 uh, one of my three questions is: uh, Could you elaborate on the whole? Toyota Vangelis name. <laughs> uh, yeah, Toyota Vangelis, that's my like artist name. That's the name mm -hmm. under which I perform. And I kind of tell the story of a like parallel present or, uh, or maybe parallel future to, to our world in which mm -hmm. The humanity was uh, uh, driven by the beauty of music of Vangelis to became like better, better humanity. I, I don't know if, but but it's also like very ironic because I don't know who of you know these like insane performance performances by Vangelis from like the nineties or and two thousands when he had like helicopters and oh, yeah. boats and <laughs> and whatnot like part of the part of the shows and I was like oh wow if, if that like actually worked you know and like the man kind was yeah. like just you know it was a so bit over the top of, like... right to be honest yes you know, <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah and uh so, so like it's it's a like parallel timeline in which like the people are able to like create to actually create like better world uh, and uh in that world, uh, car named after Van Vangelis is, is a real thing, right? <laughs> Perfect. I love it. I love it. Great. The Toyota Vangelis. So, have you ever suggested that to Toyota to create the to Toyota Vangelis? Or yeah, I don't know. You tell me. How do I talk to Toyota? In Japanese, probably. Um... <laughs> No, that's great. So thanks, thanks so much. I was just, I was just intrigued by that. And um, for everyone that I'm gonna talk to uh, at Bastel, I'll have the same question because you guys have some great artist names there. Um, then my my second question that I have is, if you were to go back to that point in time, uh, the time when you first started getting into the the whole DIY sphere when you got your hands on that first monotron that you disassembled and started to tinker with if you were to give that person one piece of advice or uh, give them one piece of wisdom what would that be mm, I guess just don't be afraid to break stuff 
<laughs> I mean, like, it's yeah. I I guess that's. I mean, it it it's it's really emotional when you like make something in the circuit burn, mm -hmm. and it has this like very special smell. Yeah. When you burn electronics, and it, it's somehow magical, and it doesn't really happen to me anymore, which I'm a little bit sad about. But uh, I, I think I think if you see it as like something magical rather than like 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 a disastrous thing, I think that helps. <laughs> and could I actually then take that to a higher level and say? Well, on the one hand, burning your circuit boards is a very catharsis, uh, something that, 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 that feels like a catharsis for you, where you say, okay, well, I can just drop all the tension that I have because the thing that happened has happened and I don't need to worry about this anymore because it's already done. Um, but do you also then see the whole notion of don't be afraid to break things even broader than 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 technology and gear but maybe if if we pull that back into the first conversation that we had about relationships about uh connecting modules together and don't be afraid to break a connection to look for something that's better uh, do you want to take it as far as that or is that me looking into that comment too much um that's an interesting take uh i don't know if i have enough because i i recently went through a breakup after like very long time no, i'm sorry and... to hear that but uh, you know it totally like it gives you a different perspective on your life and like gives you a new chance to figure out who you who, who you want to be and how mm -hmm. who you are or you what kind of version of the person that you are you want to be or mm -hmm. so I guess that's also good and healthy to to some degree but uh, yeah I'm, I, I'm I'm not sure if I would be so brave to apply it to my to my life this way I can imagine I can imagine absolutely and especially if you've just gone through such a um... Uh, life-altering event absolutely um, which might hurt a lot but at the same time also uh, eventually start to feel like a rebirth or a renaissance of course um, yeah no I, I totally understand that so um, that brings me to my last question so I've been <laughs> I've been picking your brain for more than an hour already uh, Vachlov, and I'm, I, I do truly appreciate that but I do want to return the favor so do you have any any questions or is there anything i could answer for you as well at the same time to uh well return the favor so to say oh well i i wasn't ready for this one <laughs> no i know <laughs> that's the reason why i ask it <laughs> right um um like what is what would be like the sound that you would like to make? Uh, uh, on a synthesizer, but it would be a sound that's that's like your maybe earliest childhood memory or a memory that's like so fuzzy you can't hear it anymore, but something that's like very like deep in your memory. Like, what, what, would, what would that sound be? That is an absolute great question. Let me say that first. So if I were to go back to my first childhood memories, uh, those were all in the, um, the second home we as a family lived in. And one of my first memories uh, from that time is that I think I, it was something like my second or my third birthday and it was snowing at the time which was at that time quite normal uh, to have snow in the Netherlands at late November nowadays it well with all global warming and everything it would be quite phenomenal to have snow in November um, so I I have this distinct memory of 
um, around that time about walking in the snow so that that crunchy sound that you get when you walk in the snow that is one thing and the other one which is on the complete opposite of it is when you are walking through mud and your uh, your boots are getting uh, sucked into the mud and when you then pull them out of the mud that sound that slosh kind of sound those two sounds mm. would be the first two that would come to mind for me mm. that's fascinating i i mean i don't have kids but like it kind of makes sense because like in my mind mm -hmm. like my first memories are like way beyond the time when i could walk but that's totally not true <laughs> Mm -hmm. but that's just like how it exists in my mind yeah but like the, the 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 thing that like your memory is like the sound of your footsteps that's that's kind of fascinating yeah, yeah and i i do have earlier memories but i don't necessarily um have any sort of notion or very specific sounds um i might want to add a third one to it uh so my dad was at that time working for commodore um, so um, we used to have computers around the the, uh, the house all the time and just the sounds of those all the computers just booting up just the the beeps and the hard disks spinning up that's also a sound that will, I'll, I'll never um, I'll never forget and something that you can't simply replicate uh, except by using samples of course it's not something you can really synthesize yeah Hmm. Really so cool. now I'm now I'm just <laughs> now I'm just rattling on. But great question, and I I duly thank you and appreciate that question. It's great to think about those things again. Um, that being said, um, I do want to open it up for Q and A for the uh, for the people in the audience. So you know how this works. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions uh, for Vachlov uh, or for me, of course. And uh, I do have some questions already uh, being posted in the channel. I'll just read them to you and you can then um, respond to that. So I do see that we, okay, let me just go ahead. So the first couple are from, from Dan G or Dang. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, they say, um, I just bought the Ikari filter. It's really unique and I like the fact that it's both stereo and includes a VCA. I do have a few questions. What does post sound mean to Bastel? It's evidently not the same as post sound in the video world. Oh, uh, wow, I'm not sh Ah, like this. Yeah, uh, I think it's more, I think when we started to use the post sound or rather that's something that actually came from, from the Animate Studio, the guys who make our graphics. Mm-hmm. It well, like when we first started to use it for, I think it was T-shirts. Yeah. Uh, it was like very much this uh, era when post truth was like very like spelled out thing. So mm -hmm. there was like the uh, the the early Trump era, which yeah. seems like forever ago. But uh, oh yeah. So so this is like around the time when we started to use it and. Uh, it kind of felt like everything, like if, if truth can be posed, if there is something like after truth and there's like new life to something that felt like a stable thing in the world, like what would be like post sound? Because yeah, sound like... It's almost absolute, like, right? Yeah. Yeah, but like the sound actually, it, 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 it's kind of fascinating because like sound like travels as a wave mm -hmm. and like what comes after the sound that, that, that when it like runs through a, through a space, it's, it's maybe an echo of the sound or a reflection of the sound, or it's just like these, the, the, these same air molecules that like vibrated or carried an emotion, uh, or, or a meaning now they're just like still in the air or like just carry a bit of the echo yeah i don't know that's kind of post sound to me that's a great point and i'll i'll have to think about that 
So we're going to continue with Dan's questions after we've heard from Wavy, who just joined us on stage uh, for their question. Hey, Wavy, how are you? Hi, hi, hi thanks. Cheers from Italy. So hey. I have a question for Vaslav. And he already mentioned the collaboration with Anime Studio. And I was thinking that uh, what drove me towards um, Vaslav Instruments was the how they looked and the whole um, graphic aspect of them, the whole aesthetic. And I was wondering uh, if you could like um, tell us some more about the, this collaboration and how uh, do you know each other, if they are uh, a part of Bastel or something that it's outside it. And if you can elaborate on that, I would love like to hear how these very mm, interesting uh, graphic and aesthetic identity came out. Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Not a lot of people ask, but I'm glad you like it. I, I really love it too. I actually, we've met at the art school with both of those guys, uh, Philip Nerat and Petr Cabalka. So I was in the same studio with Philip. They were they are both a bit older than me, about same age as Andre. And uh, uh, we we've met at, at the art school, and when like we we tried to work with another friend from the art school for some of the first Tanduino designs, but uh, at some point we needed to cram like a really a lot of information into very small space on one of the instruments and uh, that's when i when that friend told us like hey that's not even possible like you would not be able to read that so then we just tried to ask them and basically since then we collaborate and uh, i always really liked what they were doing they really are those type of designers that really like are on top of the trends and when they send us like new designs it's like i'm like looking at it i'm like i don't i'm not i don't even know if i like that and then like <laughs> you know a year or how or two years later like you see that everywhere so there are these types of designers that like always like are a bit like ahead of the trend or like really following that closely before it happens so i really appreciate that about what they do and uh philip is also a musician and a dj so he kind of has you know and and we've been in the same art school and i think that that, that makes a lot of difference because we speak the same language we like talked to the same teachers we read the same books we share the same language. We can really easily understand each other. And I think that, that uh, that's a big part of what makes so that is it work for us. Animate Studio, right? Yeah. Let me just uh, post a, you uh, a link uh, to the people in the uh, companion channel. Great. And great question, Wavy. Any follow-up questions from, uh, from your side? Um, not much, really. I already heard what I wanted to know in the interview. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your thank question, you. Wavy. Thanks for joining. Um, just to follow up. And the nice thing is, of course, that the rest, the couple of questions that um, that Dan G or Dan asked as well is, uh, why did you decide with to go with all black panels? That's their personal uh, preference. And also related the wood panels. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. a bit more on that? yeah um so i think the kind of evolution of these like looks and different solutions for panels and enclosures it really went through what was available and what we thought looked good mm -hmm. so for a very long time we couldn't get to work with a company that could actually do nice looking aluminum panels yeah that would have like all the silk screen like really well aligned and it would be in a good durable quality with like enough detail and that the cutting would be precise enough because we used to use a lot of like really small slide switches early on and for that you need quite precise cutouts so we didn't really 
found a good company to work with aluminum when we were starting with modules so and and we by coincidence like or like for for the reasons like there was a cnc machine that we co-own with, with with a friend so we basically like went on and prototyped the panels on on the wood and then like it actually worked so we really liked how it looked mm -hmm. and we found a printing facility that could print on the wood and then we would do the varnish ourselves so it was uh, it was quite a tedious process but it was kind of the only way that we at, at our disposal yeah uh, and still to my knowledge there's like one company that we worked with uh that can do like good aluminum panels in in this quality and that, that's in germany but you know it's uh it's quite pricey mm -hmm. and uh, so, so then we worked with with this company and with them we developed like this uh, interesting process of um uh of like two phase anodization of the panel so they first anodize the panel like a little bit then they printed the silk screen and then anodized it again and that way it's, it's some sort of electrochemical process that basically hardens uh, the surface of the aluminum and because it's done after the printing the the color kind of bakes into the material and it's like a lot more durable than than it normally would so then, then we were like happy with that. So we we switched to the aluminum panels, and eventually we started to uh, to experiment with the with the PCB material for for face plates, mm -hmm. which is something that we saw other companies like 4MS and Make Noise. So yeah. they've been also doing that. So we started experimenting with that and it's also really hard to find a company that can do it reliably and uh, in a good quality uh, with, uh, with relatively low um, amount of uh, panels that uh, that you so let's say like if you do it like this there's also always going to be a percentage of panels that you can't use mm -hmm. because this process is not really uh, designed uh, PCB manufacturing is not designed for things to look beautiful, and that's also how how they how they treat it in the factories. It needs to be functional, and it needs to, like the electrical part needs to be like pristine. So, uh, so somehow we figured it out with like one Chinese company, but uh, when when COVID hit uh, and uh, it was like straight after. Uh, Chinese New Year when people were like traveling all around China and uh, so then they closed down the country and they couldn't get back to the factories and they probably had to so 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 the whole manufacturing was really delayed and like the quality yeah. dropped like significantly so oh, wow. yeah and it was very unpredictable what we're actually gonna get in what kind of quality so we actually came back to work with a, with a local PCB manufacturer that we actually used to work with in, in our early days in when we did the Standuino circuit board. Okay. So now we do the faceplates locally. Uh, we are really able to talk to the higher management of the company, which is something <laughs> we couldn't do, do before because we were involved in some like um, local innovation incubators or something like that so they actually like helped us to like fine-tune their process uh, to make the matte black finish look like really good yeah otherwise this is like very um uh, very unreliable process to make panels and like we know from from also the our colleagues from other companies that yeah they need to like just throw out a lot of panels because they just look bad. Yeah. Uh, just a, a follow-up question again from Wavy. Is the soft pop 2K made of PCB material as well? Yes, it actually okay. is. Uh, 
and I really like this finish. It like feels really good. Uh, it's it's very durable, and the printing looks amazing. Like I've never seen like such a good printing, like ever. You know, <laughs> they they <laughs> it just like looks really good. The graphics look really good, and you know this this method of doing PCB panels, it allows you to do like several cool things. Like you can have the backlit panel, so you can have the mm -hmm. panel light up. Uh, uh, so so that's really cool. You can also do like white silk screen, but you can also have like this silver, uh, uh, silver details uh, that uh, is basically like what you would have as pads for, for soldering in yeah. the in the PCB. So you have like this sort of like uh, playground that you can work with like graphically and visually that I think is like really, um, it just like looks really good. And I've, and now that we're working with this local company, I I really love how, how this whole thing looks. Mm -hmm. And also like we kind of took the, the opportunity and designed also the sides and basically made a whole like manual uh, on the on on the box itself so yeah yeah absolutely so there is like this like graphic manual that uh, helps you to remember some of the uh, some of the button combinations yeah and especially if I, if i do look at the the soft pop 2 it is on <laughs> uh, first things first it's an absolute beautiful instrument of course and Thank you. I, I I would be just from the the level of detail that went into the design, uh, but also the the level of detail needed to have that much information on a faceplate. I think that it would have been very challenging to do this on anything else than PCB. I would assume. Yeah, I mean the hard part about you know three dimensional enclosures. Mm -hmm compared to just like face plates is that if, if you're making like folded metal or anything like that, it's really hard to print on that. Um, yeah. And like the precision and like the quality is like very, it's something that's kind of hard to rely on. And I would say, especially like now, you know, when like a lot of companies are affected with, uh, with the yeah. pandemic and, and you might, might be facing like a skilled technician not being able to do like certain production run and so so, so uh i think with, with this we kind of somehow found some way of predictability for making enclosures which is something we've been like struggling really hard in the past i can imagine absolutely no perfect and th thanks for uh for asking that um, a follow-up question then is uh, also related to the Softpop 2 is your collaborations uh, with Casper or um, as I said Peter Atwoods have been very productive do you have plans to do more of this yeah so uh, we have a few more modules that uh, that we designed with Peter that uh, that are coming out hopefully this year let's hope it's gonna happen <laughs> uh and uh, so right now Pe peter actually moved out of brno and he lives in the united states in in vermont at this point oh i didn't know so that it's so it, it's been a bit more challenging to collaborate so yeah uh but also it it has some bright sides maybe to the collaboration as well, but um, uh, so, so basically we are still trying to finish everything that we have started when when we were still, you know, sharing sharing space and meeting daily. So this is kind of like our first goal. This is what we also like, you know, aimed to do, like let's finish what we started and yeah. then, then, let, then let's see where we go from there. That's perfect, and I uh, and there's still it, yeah. st 
still awesome stuff to to come out of this so yeah so i, I i'm almost hesitant to, to ask about uh, what you guys have in store for us in the rest of 2022 <laughs> Um, but uh, Dan already asked a question, a follow-up question to that, and he 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 blatantly states, "We need a Bastel Casper oscillator. That is all." <laughs> so I'm not if, I'm not sure if that is in the stars, but maybe you can we'll, we'll share a bit about your plans there. Uh, we will be releasing an oscillator this year, but it's wow. not really um, made in collaboration with peter okay uh, well interesting i'm looking forward to that absolutely so you heard it here first folks <laughs> there's going to be an oscillator coming from Basel. This well <laughs> well i hope it's this year you know because you know stuff's quite unpredictable but absolutely. we're getting close we're getting close but if we get the chips and everything fingers crossed yeah. fingers crossed yeah. and um from all of the conversations i've had with uh, Eurorack makers over the course of the last year, everyone has been impacted by the the chip shortages, and everyone has been impacted, of course, by the the well the supply chain disruptions that happened over the course of the last twelve months as well. So um, uh, don't worry, I think that the the clientele will truly understand uh, the situation that you need to work with. Um, yeah, yeah. So then uh, a question from uh, from Dual Tricks. Um, is there a chance in the future that uh, you might have a micro granny that will be stereo 32-bit mixing and a hi-fi stereo DAC for rendition? That's quite an elaborate question. Thanks for that, uh, Dual that's a That's a very detailed question. Um, uh, I would say there is a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we've been working on, on 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 the architecture that could do something like that. So, uh, when it's gonna happen, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, great. Well, Dual Tricks already thanks you for that answer. So uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, then we get some questions from Antonin. Um, First is a very personal question to you, uh, Vachlov, and what does open source mean to you as a as a concept? Um, like to me, it really means an opportunity to learn, uh, because I think that's I'm I'm very grateful to the open source community because that's how I learned everything mm -hmm. about building synthesizers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I really think it, it is about sharing. Uh, so, I mean, the people have been sharing information even long before the term open source even existed. So yeah, there is this like amazing newsletter called Electronotes that has been notorious in the synth designers world. That's <laughs> been coming out since seventies maybe. And uh, but like now you can basically like go and see, you know, quite a few different companies and like see their files and uh, big shout out to Emily from Mutable and uh, yeah, absolutely the, yeah and who like was like very um important in in this in in leading the way and uh, a lot of people followed including uh including bustle sharings like yeah. some of the stuff not the production files because uh, mm -hmm. we actually as a company make living making the stuff yeah. whereas uh and, I mean, he's outsourcing the production, so uh, it's basically <laughs> one one person company. So, yeah, she's uh, she's been very evangelical about the the whole open source approach and the Creative Commons approach more specifically there as well. And yeah, uh, f when you started, um, did you take her approaches and her philosophy to mind, or is that just something that you just rolled into? Um, I think I've actually been more influenced by other people in the field mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. than more than Emily, but I've 
I've looked over like all the schematics she made, and uh, it's uh, there's like really inspiring and Absolutely, like really, yeah. really 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 good engineering behind that. That uh, you know, it's like when you work with electronics, like everything has been kind of figured out by like some people at some universities, and uh, <laughs> if you like none of what we do like none of the filter topologies or like amplifiers or whatnot like all the all the building blocks already exist and yeah. uh if, if you have a technical if you have a technical background maybe you can like go to some of these like places that i really don't know how to go to and like get the information from there Mm -hmm. uh, but like for somebody like me, it's a lot more approachable if you see like this is how it's used and this is what it does and this is in the context how I want to use it and then you yeah. can like look at it, understand it and maybe modify it. So yeah, so to, to yeah. truly step away from the more academic uh, theoretical approach, more to the pragmatic applicable approach and say well if you do this then this will happen going forward yeah and i i actually had this conversation because i also work with um engineers like actual like trained engineers and uh, they often like are like hey let's do it like this I'm like why nobody does it like that because <laughs> like i mean i i've seen like i have something that they don't have i've seen like a lot of schematics and I'm, i know how people do it you know yeah and i know this is gonna work but sometimes they learn something different at school or found found it somewhere else and it might work but like there might be a reason why nobody does it like that i don't know <laughs> So but, like, on, on the one hand, know, it's it's not to 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 move away from the beaten path, but on the one hand, um, you could also apply Pippi Longstocking's approach and saying, "Well, I've never done this before, so I think I can do it." Yeah, I mean, if you <laughs> see somebody else made it before you and it worked, then it's it's kind of really reassuring and makes it a bit. Uh... I don't know. You're you're not just like alone in the dark. No, absolutely, and I I, I totally understand why that's. You don't want to, well, you don't want to invest a lot of money or time or energy. Maybe the last thing is most important into something that has not been proven yet. Um, but do you think that with that approach in mind, you will still have the innovative power that uh, and the well the disruptive approach that Bastel is known for uh, yeah I mean sure mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean I, I've done like some really weird things like circuit wise uh, <laughs> that like I don't think there is any like theoretical framework for that uh, like the Bastel castle yeah like yeah, that like absolutely. mini modular like the way the signals are mixed in the patch bay that doesn't make any sense like from an engineering standpoint so no but I've, I've, I've always thought that that was more of a um more of an instinctive or an intuitive approach to it as opposed to so more of an art uh, an artful approach as opposed to more of a theoretical tried and proven approach um, I'm, I mean, I, I was more kind of trying to talk about like the schematics of how, yeah, yeah, how but it's the, actually, especially how it's especially actually the, the schematics because as you right. said, well, okay. from a theoretical standpoint, they didn't really make sense, but still it worked and it delivered beautiful, mm. uh, beautiful results, of course. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I was just like trying how to which is like also like super weird you know like i was just basically trying to fit a whole synthesizer on a footprint of three double a batteries which <laughs> is probably not the way how you should design synthesizers but like sometimes my brain like gets really uh, but th i think i think that's the same that's the same when you applied 
I just want to create music in fourth tracks. So you apply a limitation upon yourself to yeah. drive your creativity to the well to its extremes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And somehow my brain works well under these conditions, so that mm -hmm. happened. Superb. I love it. So Ooh. what 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 you're saying is that we as a community would probably need to inspire you to apply more limitations upon yourself because then that's where you really shine apparently mm. <laughs> no worries that's just me joking no worries i mean it's like at some point i mean i'm also like music wise i think i'm getting to a point when i know a little bit more what i want to do mm -hmm. and i i i don't need the limitations that much they just like okay. help but I, I don't need them that much. So I think that might also be my way going forward, designing instruments. Yeah. Just like uh, going for a very powerful architecture and just like doing doing something without being limited. Yeah. And that's, of course, also talking about the, the maturity in in yourself but also within Bastel as a as a community where where you might say okay well on the one hand yes of course uh, limitations will be well will be a catalyst for innovation and for uh, creativity uh, but you are now at a point where um, the maturity and the lessons that you've learned uh, up until this time will have given you enough insight where you can now take well free reign so to say and design with with all those lessons uh in the back of your mind well i don't really know for sure i just want to try it <laughs> and maybe I'll fail. <laughs> but of course well when you fail that's probably like the best lesson you can ever learn yeah well <laughs> Well That's, said. <laughs> well, of course. Well, and 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 that ties in nicely. Uh, on the one hand, with your um, comments about okay, well, when you burn through a um, a circuit, or when you burn through a a bit of PCB, and and that's actually following up with not the next question from Antonin, uh, but uh, the question behind uh, following that. Uh, they said, I was talking with some friends about burnt resistor candles after burning resistors during a workshop in Noise Kitchen. It would be a very pleasant kind of merch from Bastille. So burnt resistor <laughs> candles. Could we expect something like that in the uh, Noise Kitchen <laughs> merchandise well, section? Well, maybe Antonin can make them. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and then sure. as, as a follow up question about the, um, the open source question is, are you planning on continuing making Bastille products, firmware and hardware open source, for example, the SP2? Uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. to a degree, like, yeah, we want to be, uh, I mean, there is this like, technical term open source hardware that is defined by sharing the source files and yeah, yeah. we won't be probably sharing source files like manufacturing files uh, for things that we still manufacture because we yeah. basically make a living of manufacturing absolutely yeah. that and the whole ecosystem is dependent on that but uh, we are sharing schematics and we are sharing code where where it's uh, like possible or where, you where know, it makes sense absolutely where, where, where all involved parties are willing to share that and uh, mm -hmm. the soft box certainly is is uh, very um i don't know invitive in in that respect and will be that's great oh, and i wholeheartedly understand on the one hand uh, you want to well from the whole open source discussion we just have had where it's all about on the one hand um, sharing but also at the same time giving back uh, but also about well making sure that you and the rest of the um, 
of the the Bastl family are able to well make a living and support your families as well at the same time and i think that that's something that everyone will be able to well agree with and understand um then a couple of comments there so kyle from signal sounds uh gives some feedback on the graphic style he does say um it's it's very modern and he also mentions that um, they and I, I'm assuming that Kyle meant, meant to say over at Signal Sounds had a full 6U demo rack of the wooden panels a while back and it looked stunning mm -hmm. so that's great feedback from uh, from Kyle awesome thank you thank you so much and um, Antonin mentioned um, it's crazy how good the white silk screen fills look on the SP2 yeah yeah Absolutely. they look amazing yes. and then a follow-up comment from dual tricks about the um <laughs> uh, the micro granny um well uh, <laughs> 3.0 or something uh, like that uh where he, he he does mention that there is a need for that in any format standalone or euro um then we've got a follow-up question from kyle Call from mm -hmm. Signal Sounds that uh, asks, will we ever see a return of the more esoteric modules like Kong, Servo, or Solenoid? Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe. I mean, that is there has been like other people that have mm -hmm. done these these types of products. I mean. I really wanted to do them because nobody was making them back in the day. Yeah. Back in the day. And now there's been like, I don't know, Polyant and data machines and other, other solutions and coma also. So, I mean, the ideas were, you know, thrown in the pot and like the, the makers have made other products with, with, with this kind of focus. So, I I lost a bit of uh, motivation to to pursue that. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, yeah, with the with the motor or mechanical oriented modules, I like always like I've been making some mechanical installations also at the art school, and I always felt like the hardest part to do is the actual the actual mechanics of the whole thing like i mean it's easy to like hold a solenoid and make it hit a string of a guitar but like <laughs> if you want like this thing to hold to work throughout the whole super booth oh yeah that's difficult like if you want to like have that motor hitting the string for like you know four days straight that's like that's a big step up step up and if you want it like go even further and have it run as an installation somewhere for weeks or months that's um so so and the, the main issue there it really is the mechanics of the whole thing and i feel like uh this is like widely misunderstood about working with motors in general or like making these like mechanical acoustic things that people just think they're gonna get the motor, the thing that makes the motor move, and this is it. But then that's kind of where it starts. And yeah. uh, I I found my own solutions, but they are not like uh, something I would want to sell to anyone. It's like very like, <laughs> Because then you very, also like, need to sell something like consultancy on an hourly basis to everyone who buys them yeah maybe maybe uh i mean dada machines they, they've made some like really good accessories uh to go with that so they did yeah. put some innovation into it polyand made a bit more of a um, yeah like finished package that kind of goes on mic stands which is like this kind of brute force approach that's like not very cheap or elegant but you know it, it serves a purpose and it's it's like something you could rely on so yeah i mean there it, it, there is a range of stuff but like i i never got really 
really that good at like mechanics and I would really need to dive into like 3D printing and stuff like that. Yeah. Which is something I unfortunately never really had the opportunity to spend time yeah. learning. Because the, that, that would probably have been a bit after your um, maker um, upbringing because that the whole 3D printing happens probably like eight years ago and then when you say okay well you were yeah. during the first wave of the maker community which was like 10 years ago yeah yeah I mean when when I was still studying and had the time to learn it was still like really really expensive yeah it was like very the very first iterations of 3D printers so yeah, yeah that wasn't really available yeah uh, do you foresee a time when Bastel will actually start to um, uh, release cases again? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, it really comes down to if we have a good design that's like replicable. Um, uh, I mean, we've we've been we, we had the wood workshop running for quite some years, and we made the wooden cases, and I think the market kind of saturated with mm -hmm. those. And then you know, there are these cases for the Moog mother and Ber Beringer made their cases. Yeah. So yeah. it's even like I, I think the market is kind of saturated. I think what might be still a bit of a territory where, uh, where there is the room for improvement is really like those like gigging cases with like good lids that you can you know travel with that are lightweight yeah, uh, yeah. i mean there are cases that you obviously can travel with but like a lot of, a lot of them are quite heavy uh so i don't know i'm, I'm not really that such an expert to come up with like you know there are like people like a lot better than uh, like in in this area that uh, yeah that are you know spending their focus on that so I'm yeah. I'm I'm not really sure if we really have that much to bring to the table but we have a new developer on the team so let's see maybe he comes up with something well fingers crossed well Kyle has something to add to that and and and, and he he adds well Eurac cases are a really hard business proposition. And I've That's had a true. yeah, I've had a uh, a really long in depth discussion with uh, Aryan from Too Many Sins a couple of weeks back. Uh, That's actually also on the on the channel as well. And the whole the uh, the amount of work that goes into a a decent Eurorack case is typically underestimated by the by the masses. So yeah, okay. that of course comes into play as well and. It's not like you can easily create a um, a design that will then be sold a hundred thousand times uh, because of the well the size of the community as well. So yeah, that's uh, uh, that's very understandable. Um, so then just to uh, to finish up, so we some comments from Antonin. He is uh, he's gonna be on it for the uh, <laughs> the the burnt resistor candles, so uh, we can expect something from Antonin in the uh, next couple of weeks. So Antonin, please do share that link on the uh, <laughs> Modular Clubhouse Discord. I will appreciate uh, them uh, you doing that. Uh, I do see that Kyle also mentioned that good and affordable three D printing machines are only available in the last four years or so. So I do have to agree with that. Yeah. And then, yeah, I'm just gonna do one uh, final call as they do in the uh, in the pub as well. So final round, anyone who wants to uh, add or ask anyone uh, something at this point in time, this is your last chance. And um, if not, then I, I do have to thank you again so very much, uh, Vachlov for uh, for joining us today uh, and it's been amazing to have you for this amount of time and to discuss on the one hand Bastel but also you as a person and I've um, I've come to understand you a, a lot better and I thank you for your um, yeah for your openness and for your answers and for the discussions that we've had 
it's been great yeah thank you so much it's been very pleasant and um, thank thanks all for joining I, I i had fun it was really nice nicely spent evening talking talking to you so thank you <laughs> perfect i do thank you so much uh, so for everyone else oh i do hear a last ping there Let's see what we have Oh yeah, well, um, a lot of thanks for you, uh, Fajla, for, for joining. Um, so for everyone who has joined here tonight live, I do want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, for everyone who is listening to this recording afterwards, thank you so much for your time and listening to this uh, presentation of the Modular Clubhouse. Um, so feel free to join our Discord server. Uh, the link will be in the description down below. And um, do feel free to... Uh, have a look at the YouTube channel where we will have um, much more of these interviews and open Q&As uh, recorded as well, uh, but also a lot of uh, videos on modules, on synthesizers, on standalone equipment, on studio monitors, maybe even microphones in the future as well. Um, feel free to uh, have a look, S like and subscribe if you want, and um, for now, I would say, everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, and let's make 2022 a very synthy and very worthy year. Thanks so much. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.